So our epistle reading today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. And this is the text that I'll focus my sermon on today. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. The choice to love, Bell Hooks writes, is the choice to connect, to find ourselves in the other. I am I'm struck by Bell Hooks' use of the word choice in this quote. Is love a choice? It's not something you fall into or fall out of. It's not a romantic obsession. I wonder. According to our God, love is a command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. But then we are free to ignore these commands, to choose a path that is not of God. What would our world look like, I also wonder, if people understood love as a choice and chose it. If people chose connection over segregation, if people chose to attend to the suffering of others, to bear witness, to lean towards understanding and empathy, rather than leaning away and looking away. I imagine this world would look a lot like a bell hooks style of classroom. In my book that I wrote, Necessary Risks, I highlight the democratic teaching style of bell hooks, who is a master educator and a prolific writer. Y'all should read all her books. (laughs) And bell hooks, in her classroom, she fosters a learning community based on an ethic of love, grounded in care, respect, and a commitment to everyone's learning. The transformative power of a bell hook style of classroom is in the stance of the teacher, not as dominator or controller, not as a dispenser of information into passive students and passive minds, but as the facilitator of a learning community based in an ethic of love. Teachable moments, 
They arise constantly in life. For bell hooks, these are not moments to impose your beliefs, your information on another. That's the way of the dominator and the way we are socialized in today's culture, where there must always be a superior and an inferior party. Arguments and analysis don't really matter in such a culture because we're not really listening. We're just fighting to dominate or win. Bell Hooks presents an alternative model. When teachable moments arise, we can see them as opportunities to foster dialogue where we can each learn from one another. Moments when you and your friend's conversation turns to an issue about race, human sexuality, abortion, and you discover you have a different take on the issue. Moments when a family member says something you believe to be wrong and you feel the need to speak up. Moments in a Sunday school class or a committee when you are asked to discuss a topic with people who hold more conservative or more liberal views than yours. When these moments arise, we have choices to make. First, will we risk teaching? Will we risk dialogue? And if so, how do we approach that dialogue? Will we enter the moment with a radical openness, choosing to love and connect with the other, or will we default to our dominator mode, seeking to impose our views, our argument, like it's a competition to see who comes out on top? Well, as I wrote my book, all, and I wrote and I, and I dug into the work of Bell Hooks and started to absorb all she was teaching me, all I could think about was my father, who I love. But after the 2016 presidential election, our relationship grew tense and strained. I hear ya. <laughs> this scenario is likely familiar. Who hasn't had a relationship ruined by politics today? My father, a lifelong Republican, voted for Donald Trump. I did not. We are a family that talks about meaningful, meaningful things and current events. But after the 2016 election, whenever politics came up, someone, usually me, started shouting. I remember one conversation in particular. We were on this amazing family vacation with my parents in Costa Rica, enjoying dinner together at a beautiful restaurant. And I don't know how politics came up, but it did, and Donald Trump. And you know, in that moment, I would have described my verbal tone as assertive and strong. But my eight-year-old daughter said I was shouting. <laughs> Upset and tearful, she's crying. Why is mommy shouting at grandpa? <laughs> so after that, I tried not to make my kid cry anymore. And I just avoided these tough conversations with my father altogether. But then I started writing necessary risks and reading bell hooks, and I couldn't avoid this sore spot in my life anymore. So I asked my dad if we could have a real conversation about politics and the issues we disagreed on. I told him, I told him I wanted to be fair to him and to those who hold more conservative views than mine. We set an appointment to chat over Zoom. He lives in Florida at a time when both of us could be relaxed and undistracted, I meditated beforehand, and I, I did those deep breathing exercises that, you know, the ones that Navy SEALs do before they go into a dangerous mission. 
Throughout my conversation, our conversation, my dad shared some Fox News sounding phrases that made me cringe. In turn, I shared some liberal, liberal tropes that made his eyes roll hard and he threw his head back in frustration. But we kept talking, kept choosing love because we kept surprising each other. I was finally listening, rather than loudly cutting him off every time he offended me. And as I listened, I learned new things about my father, how he was feeling in that political moment, where his opinions came from. And then, then I heard my father lament what he called a hardening within himself. He lamented how he used to be more open, more willing to listen to others and other viewpoints. I lamented my, heart, my father's hardening too, and I recognized it in myself. It's that, that defensive, rigid, fight posture we default to in our dominator culture which is unfortunate in so many ways. Because when we harden, we become resistant and closed off. When we harden, we can't embody the soft, open ethic of love. When we harden ourselves, nothing gets better. As much as I disagree with many of my dad's positions, I want to be in conversation with him. My dad has a lifetime of experiences and knowledge that I can benefit and learn from. I also just want to have a good relationship with my dad. So after we ended our call, I felt good. Dad and I hadn't screamed at each other. We didn't hang up in a huff. I was left feeling like I'd actually try talking politics with him again. And we have. Good thing, because here we are again, heading into another prickly presidential election. 1 Corinthians 13 is a favorite passage to read at weddings, but Paul had more than romantic love in mind. The English language has only one word for love, but the Greeks had six words to describe this complex emotion so foundational to the human experience. Agape is the love we read about in 1 Corinthians 13, a radical love for others grounded in an ethic to care for all humanity beyond our differences and despite our immersion in a world addicted to domination and violence. Agape is God's love for humankind, represented in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For Christians, agape inspires our lives and our call as disciples. Paul understood agape as the antidote to the Corinthian community's problems. In his commentary on this passage, Jeffrey Jones writes that the Corinthian church was doing real and potentially destructive battle with each other over a number of issues. Paul inserts this passage in his letter not to offer pious reflection on the way things should be, but rather to call the Corinthians to account for their behavior. Everything he says Love is not, they are. Everything he says love is, they are not. The Corinthian church was trapped in a cycle of conflict exacerbated by those who were envious, boastful, angry, rude, and insistent on their own way. According to Paul, radical, ethical agape was the solve of peace. So as you heard, I am now the editor of the Presbyterian Outlook. And as the editor of the Outlook, I will sometimes receive emails or letters 
from readers who are hmm, not happy with something we've published. Sometimes the words and the tone of these emails are so angry and demeaning that they, they make me pause to check the time of day when they were sent, thinking to myself, were they tired when they sent this email? Or were they drunk? <laughs> now, it is not unusual for editors to receive such messages, a natural result of publishing words that anger some and please others. This is true. The Associated Church Press even offers an annual award for the best angry letter editors receive of the past year. We've got some doozies this year. We might win it. <laughs> but it's not unusual for pastors, educators, community leaders, heck, anyone nowadays to get messages like this either. We are living in incredibly challenging and divisive times. But I don't know anyone who can honestly say getting messages like this doesn't sting. Now, the temptation to clap back is strong. And I admit, I have at times clapped back, replying quickly and swiftly with an equally angry and sharp email is a satisfying rush. Our bodies release adrenaline and cortisol during conflict. It is important to acknowledge how good this feels, this momentary surge of power when, when, we, when we defend ourselves, our beliefs, our actions. But when we act without love, we not only diminish and demean the other party, but here's the key. We diminish and demean ourselves as well. Acting without agape, lashing out in anger, seeking to dominate or behaving unethically with no thought to the consequences of our actions. It's a bit like eating tons of junk food, Bell Hooks writes. While it may taste good, in the end, the body is never adequately nourished and remains in a constant state of lack and longing. Our souls feel this lack when we act unethically, when we act without love, behaving in ways that diminish our spirits and dehumanize others. As the editor of the Presbyterian Outlook, I want my work to come from the best parts of myself, not the ugliest. So when these messages come in, I try to pause, breathe, and ask myself, how can I love this person? How can I respond to them authentically and genuinely with agape? I don't respond immediately. Love is patient. I take my time to craft responses I hope are respectful and authentic, choosing words that won't demean as I had felt demeaned. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. If the person has pointed out a mistake I have made, I acknowledge the mistake and let the person know I will work to correct it. Love does not insist on its own way. Love rejoices in the truth. Then I hit send, not in a rush of self-righteous adrenaline, but with a sense of peace that only comes when you feel you have responded from the best part of yourself. Sometimes I hear back from people. And the tone, I tell you, the tone is always less angry, 
more respectful. Sometimes I don't hear back, and honestly, that's okay. What I've recognized is that we are liberated by love. Trying to respond in love helps me let go of and heal the hurt that angry words inevitably leave behind. Choosing to respond in love nourishes and frees my soul that could easily cycle back into demeaning, angry action. Hate and ugliness, words or actions that demean and degrade, strip us of that which agape supplies, respect, value for each person's dignity and worth, a path to healing and peace. Now friends, I have been looking forward to being here with you at East Liberty Presbyterian Church in this gorgeous sanctuary for months now. I am so grateful for the chance to help you celebrate International Women's Day. I have the privilege of serving as the second female editor of the Presbyterian Outlook in our 200 plus years of history. <laughs> I'm, I'm even more, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm even more grateful that I'm the second and that Jill Duffield was the first editor and broke that barrier before me. I'm also grateful for women whose work has shaped my life Women like Bell Hooks, whose brilliance was so bright it could not be contained or held back by unjust barriers and biases. And I'm so grateful for faith communities like this one, who support exceptional women leaders like your pastors, Heather and Patrice. I'm just going to let that one go because they deserve it. <laughs> Friends, it is clear to me that this is a community that encourages the breaking down of barriers, that fosters belonging, and that chooses love. You are a faith community that is waging love in a world that is dead set on waging war. God calls us all through Jesus Christ to be radicals in this world to be radically loving and to commit ourselves to a transformative ethic of love. This is not just about how we're gonna resolve a family fight or respond to angry emails, but how we do our anti-racism work and how we do our mission work and how we do our inner faith work. How can we choose love in all that we do? transforming our lives and the lives of others. This, this ethic, this love is not for the faint of heart. It cannot be captured cross-stitched on a pillow or read at a wedding. It is a call, a call to live and act in a wholly different manner. We are plagued by ugliness and ugly rhetoric and angry, unethical acts that demean and dehumanize. But we, we, my friends, we do not have to play that game. Amen. We are called, we are called to an alternative, soul-nourishing, world-saving path. It's the path of agape love, and it's the path with the power to liberate and heal us all. And now to the God who calls us to this radical love, be all honor and glory, thanksgiving and power now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>